You ready? Welcome to One More. I'm your host, Brian Erickson. Each week, we bring in two new guests. We sit them down on this big old couch, and we ask them why they do what they do. Put your feet up, Chris. Stay a while. (laughs) And this week, of course, is no exception. We have two bands that uh, come through on tour, both signed to Mint 400 Records. We're going to talk to them in a little bit. We have Jaron Love of The Lampshades, and we have Son of the Velvet Rat. But first, and as always... Chris Dubrow. Hey, Brian. Hey, what's up? How you doing? You going to draw Look, me like one of your French girls? Looking good on that I'm couch, man. I'm feeling sprawled today. That's nice. I got to say, so well, I played, when you came in, uh, what was it? Was it last week or the week before? And you were just sprawled It was out. two weeks ago. It was when Greenwood was on. And I was Kale, yeah. I was, I was, was sprawling. I was tired that day. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Folks, Let's. we're going to get behind the, the curtain. We're going to break that fourth wall. I was sleepy a couple of weeks ago on the show. Really? Yeah. So no if you watch way. it, you'll see no me. No way. Look, there were, I was having a great time. Those were really funny interviews. I was trying not to nod well, off a little bit. I, I mean, that's, that's, that's I may good. have hit a yawn or two. Well, that's fine because those guys are, are yeah, uh, they're friends. You know, they're friends too. So we can, you know, we, we can, can we can undo an extra button. You know, you know we, we can, can we can really we can kick off the shoes. We can yeah, kick exactly. out the undo, jams. You know how sometimes, like after you eat a big meal, you undo the belt buckle one more notch. Just, just give yourself one more. That's actually how this more. show got the name. We did. We unbent. Yeah, we it's un- not Danny Coleman. You know, uh, one more that? song, one more artist. It's it's eat a big meal, undo the buckle, one more. With Brian Erickson. How's your weekend, Brian? Uh, it was all right, man. Uh, you, I think you may have had a, a busier weekend than I I feel have. like I did. I played You shows. played Girlzilla right played, here. It was in this room. I was right there <laughs> playing a show, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, you played the heck out of that we, show, that too. That was a good one. Yeah, that was a really fun show. Shout out to uh, Katie Miller and the Girlzilla Collective, who put on an amazing, amazing event with some really fantastic artists. Yeah, I was sick on the couch Did you all day see, I got. I was getting the sniffles all weekend. Yeah, I had like a little stomach bug on oh, Saturday. So yeah, I was I was at my home, you know, five to seven minutes from here, and just wasn't gonna make it out. No, I wasn't. I didn't do anything That's Saturday. Fine. I yeah. I mean, I was just face down all day long. You rest that last weekend so you can get ready for this weekend. Because what is happening this weekend, Mr. Brian Erickson? You're playing a show. Where am I uh, you're playing, playing, playing show? a couple shows. Well, uh, you're playing um, with Rachel and a Dobkin on December eighth. Yes. Yeah. And also, so that's a big show for you. The other big show that I'm playing. I'm gonna make is, you. You're say playing it. Uh, with uh, Tara Dente and also at Asbury for? Lanes. What is that show for, Brian? Um, I don't know. Well, Bobby Mahoney is. Come on, man, get it out. You're gonna say it. it. You're gonna say it. I'm not saying. Wait, you think Bobby's headlining? I yeah, that's know. narrative. Bobby, I'm really excited to play with Bobby Mahoney, <laughs> whom I love. Paper Jets are finally releasing, releasing their new album. What's new it album? called? Every Day Forever. And who has an advanced copy of that? You do. I do, and it's a great album, and I'm very excited is it? for the world it's to hear like, it. It's okay. It's, it's all right. Listen, I'll, it checks out. I'll it tracks. You, I'll send you some notes. You know, just, I would love that. I actually. have no notes. Apparently, Daryl ha- from Low Light has told me he has notes, but I, I haven't that, seen. But them. he's got a very good ear for. He's music. a note guy. Yeah, he's a notes guy. We gotta have him in. We gotta not uh, from Low Light. Like I just want to. I want to figure out what Daryl is. You good. Know what I mean? Let's do it next next year. Next week we got on. Next week we got on Daryl from Low. We're gonna have Bobby Mahoney come in. He's going to talk about being Bobby Mahoney. I would love to talk. Would, well, let's have these guys because this is also, this is our, it's not exactly our last episode of the season. we got a special uh, one planned got, next week that's well, going to fall apart, guaranteed. Yeah, we have two special episodes. Next week, we've got the Paper Jets, which are my band, kind of doing a bit of a, a release show post-mortem, interviewed by Chris. And then the following week on December 19th, we'll be live streaming from the Asbury Hotel. We're doing a fibromyalgia uh, benefit, and that features Matt Cook, Dave Vargo, Renee Maskin of the band Low Light, uh, Matt Fernicola, the ever so distinguished, and uh, a band called Bent, which is basically Brittany and Nikki from Finding Phoebus. Uh, and uh, what are we doing in that? Are we hosting it? Am I, I don't hanging know what out? We're, doing. I, we're just we just got to sh- we what we're doing is we're lending our celebrity. Yes, to the, the event. fame we're that you the, and I it's have. It's the gravitas. How many followers do you have on Instagram? I have one thousand ninety nine. I have like. I need 
one more. I I have like maybe 20, so we're getting 1,020 people to check out our Instagram stories. That's fine. And uh, speaking of Instagram stories, I had no idea what that segue was. Do you want to bring on our first guest? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> their latest album, Astrology, is available everywhere. Let's bring out Jaron Love of The Lampshades. <clears throat> How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Good to be here. What's that? It's good to be here. I certainly hope so. Yes. (laughs) Enjoy our broken couch. Yeah. By the yeah, it's 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 getting worse every week. Uh, it's, and whose and whose fault is that? I have no idea, Brian. Whose fault do you think I'm being? Wait, where's my? Yeah. Okay. Wow. That, okay. All right. It's it's going. It's There's going just a down, black folks. bar on the screen now. I would love it if this had, uh, you know, like the roller coaster bars. You know, yeah. that you just you just kind of kind of secure in, yourself right. in. Undo know, one more belt. So, yeah, I apologize in advance. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So, so how do you come up with the album title? Is astrology like an actual factor uh, in the in the songwriting process? Uh, I have to be honest. Uh, it, it, on, when making the record, when writing the songs, I, um, I I was going through a bit of a breakup in some of the songs, and I realized that um, after the breakup, that the person I was with had the same astrological sign as my father, and that I had the same astrological sign as my mother, and I didn't realize that throughout the relationship. I see. So I kind of. So so basically what you're thing. saying is the two of us both have daddy issues. Like I'm not the only one in the room <laughs> with daddy issues. Well, that wasn't factoring was what, in uh, at the time, but it was like it's just in a, the subconscious. You know, yeah. it was yeah, I was like I was like, wow, can I make some sort of analysis of uh, you know, and and so I just kind of ran with the theme. And know. what are what are the signs here? What are we what are we what are we uh, working with? We're working with I'm air can- sign, we're working with fire signs. What's going on? It was a it was a cancer Leo setup. Oh, so. I know nothing about I, I, either yeah, of those I don't, two. I don't, really have, I don't really have much insight to, to weigh in beyond that. But like, I, I just thought it was an interesting situation and I kind of just like ran with But I, I'm not like a astrology junkie or anything like that. I don't you know, All right. have I, any yeah, major kinda... insight into the, the matter. <laughs> well, I don't, I, you know, that's, well, I guess it, it takes all kinds then, right? I don't, I'm a Gemini, so it's, it's oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's such a Gemini that June? thing that June? to say. Or June. What, June. What, what's a Gemini? thing to say what it takes all kind oh that's a very gemini thing to say yeah uh yeah uh june 9th but yeah gemini is what i guess middle of may to middle of june we must be pretty good i'm now with a a gemini that's born june 8th so there you go oh wow you two would make a great couple i don't know yeah maybe i dated uh somebody once (laughs) who was was born on june or june 10th it was june 10th how did it go like being with the same sign like did that uh, well, we were kind of young, so sure. it was like uh, it wasn't it wasn't the best. It was a lot of learning because I sure. was like you know seventeen or eighteen, so it was like yeah. you know, it was one of those. I I don't think astrology had a whole lot to do with it, but uh, I I don't know. You know, it's, it's right. It's, probably didn't have a lot to do. It probably doesn't have a lot to do with much of anything. Yeah, but so you know, we you know they write them vague enough so that you can kind of feel that you mesh with the. Whatever they say. Yeah, you know, exactly. Just like a pop song, you know. Yeah. So, so this is your fourth record here. Let's uh, let's get a little close up on that. Let's do the awkward the look where we yeah. don't Silence. say anything. Silence. I think, no, well, let me just, I'm trying to think. Was it? Was it our fourth record? I think according to Spotify, so, yeah, it might record, be the fourth record. The first record. album we did wasn't on Spotify, so it is okay. the fifth. All right. Length. So yeah. the uh, do we do we have this, Liam? We got it. Yeah. All right. Cool. And, and our bass player did the art. Yeah. <clears throat> That's nice. I like so. when you keep stuff in house like that. That's yeah. Really, I mean, yeah. This it is, was great. Yeah. This is this is really something. It was. Yeah. 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 That's some of that mid four hundred packaging right exactly. there. Exactly. The yeah. hallmark of quality. Everybody. Yes. Mid four hundred. Yes. Over at mid four hundred. Yeah. <laughs> over. Yeah. Over at the uh, over at their extensive warehouse <laughs> um so i noticed though uh your your first record or i'm sorry now i guess your second, second record yeah. surprise yes um you know there, there was kind of a little more of like a punk rock aesthetic like yeah. i know there, there's sort of a it's it's a sort of a like a punk indebted power pop Yes. Uh, almost, you know, I kind of equate it to almost like a like a Posies or a Super Chunk. Man, I love the kinda. Posies. Yeah, I just saw them live like a couple months ago. They, Did you? Yeah, yeah. They played a really small show in Pittsburgh uh, oh, with like in so a lucky. Like 40, 50 people venue. Yeah, Frosting on the Beater. Yeah, right? I was they really. Yeah, when I when I when we were doing that record, yeah, they were playing stuff from all the the records, a lot of earlier stuff. But yeah, when I when I was uh, when we made that album, we were young. Um, I mean, we we were a band for about fifteen years. And um, when we made that record, I, I was 
definitely listening to some posies like that would have been uh when i was like in high school and and i was really into that kind of thing and into a lot of um punk rock and things like that yeah so how um you know how, how did that shape the way you were writing those songs back then you know when you were kind of you know shaping those early records yeah i mean so i i read i don't know if you ever heard of the book our band could be your life but of course I, michael I read, azarod yeah yes, of course yes. so i read that that's book. like that's like indie music bible right yeah. there man so when i when 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 when, I'm, when we made surprise like i was like that was heavily influenced by that book and um you know so i was trying to do the heavy thing and then um, i mean that that book though that book got me into everything exactly. I, I mean it was, it's yeah. like i think i knew the replacements and i think that was the sort of gateway where i was like oh they got some stuff about the replacement and this was before the um like the two replacements books that are out now um what is it all over but the shouting and trouble boys i never i never delved into that they're both they're yeah. both excellent I but it's, it out, yeah the, you know so i kind of wanted to just know about them and i was like right. oh this has you know a pretty good section on yeah. them but then from there it's like oh great now i've got who's could do the meat puppets dinosaur jr black flag is this uh, just like Sonic the, Youth. I, I don't know this book at all because you know i'm <clears throat> it's just divided up into like 14 or 15 chapters it one just, on each band and it just kind of tells the story of like all these, these different yeah. like these like iconic the OG, yeah. all, Dives the all Jr., bands? Black Flag yeah. and it and yeah. the story ends when they sign when they all sign to major labels well no it leads up to Nirvana like yeah like the, but it's all right, yeah, it right, kind of yeah, but it, yeah. it leads but they're but they don't they don't really talk much about the major like the narrative of each respective band uh, like the narrative of each respective band stops after they sign to a major, but the the sort of push of the book gets to 19, uh, 1991. 91. Yeah, it's basically saying like this is like people wondered how, why did Nirvana just pop the way they did, and they're basically saying this was the catalyst that led okay. to Nirvana because yeah, it was yeah. basically just yeah all that indie. It was all those guys, but yeah. no, right. the general public obviously didn't know about any of sure. these guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because um, so. uh, Dinosaur Jr. is just one of those bands that comes up on my Spotify playlist. I'm like, oh, I should know them, and then and then you just skip I it. just skip it, and you know, go I can back give to you Mountain like Ghost. a handful of songs, I a couple, do, couple easy ones do you that, do like that'll a get you. Where you, get you know, Dinosaur Jr. together. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be yeah, fun. You should, you should do. Like, yeah, maybe. no, we'll call it. Uh, I don't know. We'll call it like Star Dinosaur Ch the Third. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. There it is. No, I was gonna say we maybe we'll call it like start chopping. <laughs> okay, that's yeah, that's uh, a, yeah, yeah, that's what start good, chopping. Good, uh, good you know, <laughs> like uh, like the like the Mountain Goats podcast. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> uh, I only yeah. Okay. I only listen to Mountain Goats. Yeah, I didn't want to say it because it makes me upset every time. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I don't get too off because I could talk about our band could be your life yeah, forever. Yeah. So, uh, but getting back to you, yeah. Um, so what role does some of that some of the what role do some of those early influences still play in your process these days? Well, so I mean like you you know, they always say like whatever you listen to when you're young is what you're sort of influenced by your whole life and you know, as you get older it's like you're trying to make sure that you're introducing enough new influences but at the core a lot of those things that that i listened to at that young age you know 17 16 17 18 years old from our band could be your life and beyond like and then of course like your beach boys beatles stuff like that oh yeah stays with you so it, it, it's a big thing but i mean then you know i'm it, it's crazy that then you're around long enough that i'm seeing a lot of these artists now that are coming up that are very much influenced by 90s music in the way that I was but like 10 years younger than me you know like me kind of rating my sister's grunge CD collection and now it's like I don't know they're rating maybe their parents CD collection now and so you know you're listening to all these people that are influenced by that but yeah everything that I listen to in my late teens early 20s is always going to be at the core of like everything I do you know what was um what artist kind of made you realize that music was something within your reach like you in that uh, reach you yeah. know because like you listen to stuff you hear the Beatles on the radio as a kid you know you hear a lot of things incidentally but what did you hear hmm. what was the first thing I think that that you heard where you said oh wow I think I could do that I think there's a moment that I remember when I was like 13 and I was in the basement of my parents house and I found a, a whole cassette and I just put it in and and I just remember hearing the 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 first in Weezer's in the garage where you just hear 
I've got electric guitar and I, and then like that and then I start and then I had like dial up internet at that time and I googled the lyrics and tried to figure out what the song was and then you I got didn't the blue Google, album. You Alta Vista. Yeah, whatever it was. This. Might not even Google. Ask, yeah, you yeah, ask like Jeeves who yeah. is yeah, the you sad asked, boy who said you, you, you asked, Yeah, who is the sad boy that says I've got electric yeah. guitars? So <laughs> I found the blue album and then I remember I went and bought it at the mall, December twenty seventh, nineteen ninety nine. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was that was it because like I bought I bought so the that blue was, album. That was essentially that was the Big Bang then. For it, you. I mean that was very influential and like a lot among other things you know listening to like again a lot of those grunge staples stone temple pilots all that stuff you know like f- f- you name it uh not mid 90s rock but that was a, that was a big moment for me there for sure oh yeah great. now um when i was just kind of you know doing my uh doing my work on sure. you guys kind of poking around i found uh the band's old blog spot oh my god page. i'm scared of this i'm oh, really yeah, no, scared no, no. and what all was right. funny <laughs> is is you know it's like oh yeah this page is barely maintained sure. uh you know for more to keep more up to date head over to our myspace page oh my god now i'm even more scared <laughs> uh i didn't i didn't really go that deep that's into good the, into the myspace good. uh found some interesting old pictures of you though yeah, but, um, yeah. which I'm we're sure. not going to share here but I, the question though that leads into this is how of all the changes in promoting music at this level at a local level um affected how you promote yourself i mean it, it's always changing i mean it's it's frankly it's sort of tough to like maintain your life and then always have to change all these new social media platforms because and, i mean blogspot yeah. and myspace that was that was like a one-two punch 10 years ago MySpace like that was seemed to amazing, work just fine yeah it was an amazing and, tool. Th- and that was a really good platform too myspace it, it was the best music plat band platform ever because all the bands that you needed to connect with to play shows out of town were they all had their profiles on there you could book your whole tour you yeah and you could everything. search by city a lot yeah. easier and yeah and now it's so decentralized there's not really a social media platform now that like is the best for musicians bands, there really is yeah and you, like, yeah you got to kind of just make a post and be like hey looking for shows in pittsburgh uh by right. the way chris if the burns are looking for shows in and around the pittsburgh or western pennsylvania area yeah. We'll talk welcome. after the show. We'll talk yeah. to we'll, yeah, yeah, we will. Yeah, we will trade information. Yeah, uh, we'll never email you back because we're not good at that. Uh, well, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, how did the relationship with Mint Four Hundred come about? Yeah, my buddy uh, Steve Donahue, who uh, plays under the name Young Legs. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, we were trying to find a label to like kind of work with to put out this record, <clears throat> and um, I got in touch with him, and he 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 contacted, put me in touch with Neil, and. Neil liked what we were doing, and you know, it it ended up working out that we we were able to kind of work with them to do some promotion and put this record out and everything like that. So yeah. Do you find it difficult to work with Neil? Uh, <laughs> not not generally, but based <laughs> not like is Neil tough to work with? Oh, period. My. No, but I mean, is it tough to work with him or with Mint Four Hundred? Um, based on just the geography because no. uh you know maybe booking things might be a little tougher and sometimes uh i feel like getting the face to face time still has some yeah. value that's a good question no i mean it's been neil's real pro and it's been great i mean i'm sitting here because of neil you know and uh just he, he's helped us uh in many ways and no it's, it hasn't been bad and, you know you can do a lot through digital media but i get what you're saying though there's some things where it is better in that way but it's been really okay good working remotely in that sense yeah excellent excellent and uh, as we start to uh, as we start to wrap this up so you guys uh, I, and I mean I guess you know before we went on I, I wanted to ask you a question or two about the band sure uh, but I know you said you're kind of this is a little bit of a transition time sure. for you so maybe we you know pivot to that instead yeah. um, you you want to talk about yeah that Transition, yeah. So I mean, we kind of um, it had a traditional line, three piece lineup we were doing for a long time, and we've kind of uh, decided after this record to kind of uh, let that go. And so I'm still out here promoting the record because you know we just put it out, you know, six months. Well, I guess eight months ago now, and um, so we're still promoting the record we're going to be doing a song from it later and then one new one that i have for a project that we'll figure out in the new year um but that sounds uh, eerily familiar yeah so i'm doing the same thing sure okay right now then with the band that. a release show this week literally this week and then that's probably the last show 
and then trying to work up something new for next year. Literally, exact, what, like that, yeah, quite literally the same yeah. exact situation. We had an amazing big release <laughs> show back in March. We had uh, we brought in some uh, two, two extra auxiliary musicians. We had a guy doing saxophone. Like we did oh, the whole that's deal. Nice. And then yeah, now so I'm doing kind of this solo thing where it's a transition period. Either going to play under my name or start a new band. But you know, I'm still very much trying to like get this record out because I, I think it's a strong record we put out. And, oh yeah, it's uh, excellent. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, top to bottom, this thing is dynamite. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Hope the hope everybody can hear it, and uh, we're real. We were real proud of it, so you know, still proud of it, and that's kind of what what it's all about right now. You know. All right, Jaron, I have one more question sure. for you, and then we'll <laughs> uh, we'll let you go. Um, what are you not doing right now that you'd like to see change going forward, musically? Or anything? I mean, you can you can answer it sort of open endedly <laughs> if you'd like. What I mean, am we're, I he, we're here to talk about your music, doing. but whatever uh, you can answer that in um, whatever way you prefer. Yeah, I mean, I well, what am I not doing? I haven't, I haven't done. Uh, you know, I kind of relied on the fact that our, our drummer in the Lampshades did a lot of the production for us, and uh, you know, Dane, his talent is seen all throughout the record, and um, so in the future, you know, I, I, I think. It, it, it'll be a little difficult kind of working not leaning on a lot of his ability um in in production so it's kind of uh i hope that i can learn a little more about that end and and do that with the work going forward and um yeah i think learn more about the actual production part and instead of just focusing on songwriting you know have to kind of gain that skill and we all should we all try to learn as musicians and performers and i think that's something i could try to gain Excellent. Yeah. Well, Jaron, thanks so much. Uh, the new album is called Astrology. It's available everywhere. Yes. Jaron Love, thanks for thanks, talking Brian. to us. We're going to hear some of this music album. later. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. <clears throat> One more sponsored by You Don't Know Jersey. Founded in 2010 by Allison and Masiak. Thanks for the pizza. You Don't Know Jersey has been covering all the best music, food, sports, art, and cultural events that the Garden State has to offer for nearly a decade. Hey, Brian, weren't you thinking aloud about where you could possibly go this Friday to catch a killer album release show featuring yours truly and the other guy who talks more but isn't nearly as funny as I am, so you should probably back off a little bit? Brian? Yeah, I was wondering, how do I... What resource would provide me with that vital hey, information? <laughs> Weren't you just asking about a hall in or around Asbury Park area to host a convention of some sort? I was. Of course you were. So whether you're in High Point, Cape May, or anywhere in between, check out youdon'tknowjersey.com for all the latest. You don't know Jersey, but Alice and Ed certainly do. Brian. You always miss. I Look, I was not, I'm not sports, okay? Yeah, I was her. Doctor Who. Okay. Um, he has been called the greatest... Austrian singer-songwriter ever. Let us welcome Son of the Velvet Rat. <laughs> Please set that up. Hey. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. Thank you for joining us, George. So, yeah, let's, let's unpack that. First and foremost, so this uh, this newspaper, uh, I, is, it, is it pronounced uh, Wiener Zeitung? Yes. Uh, yeah. They uh, very that's, good in German, actually. Oh well, thank. You. I try. I, <laughs> I don't know any German uh, other than you know, counting to ten in the seven days of the week. But uh, but your pronunciation is good. I uh, well, thank you, thank you. But uh, yeah, so that's how did that? Uh, what what's that feel like? Uh, well, I. I think I got to admit that the competition is not so uh, huge <laughs> okay, in so Austria. It's, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's a small country, and there, I mean, it's not, it's not like the United States. So, uh, not a lot of singer songwriters to compete are, with. Of course, there's, there's, there's always competition. But okay. Well, I mean, if you if you if you're related to the states, like what if someone said you're the greatest singer songwriter that New Jersey has ever produced? I mean, that's you're competing with. A couple of guys, but you know I'm saying, I mean? I mean, any state, though. I mean, yeah. every every state, every country has their, you know, has their icons. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that that would be, uh, you know, I feel like that would be, uh, you know, something to something to be proud of. And I mean, it's it's certainly out there on you. That was one of the first things I, I found. Just yeah. you know, kind of doing a little bit of it was a good uh, thing for me, definitely. Oh, I'm sure it was. Um, so you have two releases that you're here to promote, a studio record called Dorado and a live record called The Late Show. And um, you, um, 
I guess I, you know, I, I was really, I mean, I went back, I listened to a, a bunch of the records, um, and I, I was actually really intrigued by the, the Late Show uh, specifically, and I wanted to ask you, what differences do you notice uh, when you play here in the States versus when you tour over in Europe? Well, there's not that big of a difference. It's always music and uh, people um, people react to that music and but of, of course the the language barrier is bigger over there mm -hmm. because here people understand immediately immediately what I say and what, what the songs are about the lyrics and everything mm -hmm. it's a little m more difficult over there of course have you always written songs in English yes yeah yeah was that something that um, was that a, a conscious artistic decision yeah, that you made? Because I grew up with all um, this English and American music and French music. I have to okay. add that uh, all those French guys like Brel, Brassens. Oh, I guys. love Jacques Brel. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, yeah I mean, well, I, although I'll, I'll admit, uh, I know Jacques Brel through uh, Scott Walker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Scott mm. Walker. Oh, Scott Walker, of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's how I'm familiar with uh -huh. Jacques Brel's work, primarily yeah. because it's. I mean, he. I guess you know he he sang all that all that uh -huh. stuff in English. So mm -hmm. it was, uh, and that's some <laughs> that's some really dark music. Uh, some really interesting yeah. uh, thing. You know, nobody. Uh, Nobody sings the word gonorrhea uh, quite like uh, quite like that. <laughs> so I, I found that to be uh, pretty entertaining when I was when I was kind of getting into that uh, music. So, um, so has that? Um, so so you so okay. I, I'm sorry. I got I get a little off track. So you um, so you kind of made the decision you wanted to uh, write and present your music uh in english was there ever like an opportunity uh for you to do um for you to do it in your native language of course it was, would have been easier probably yeah everybody sings in german now in, yeah in, in germany or austria yeah okay. it's a big wave of, of, but um i found that uh, to sing in english it's, it's it's in a way it's more musical yeah, it just sounds better to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and I find it easier to to write meaningful lyrics in English, actually. Really? Yeah. So it's it's actually easier. And I is English your second language? It's my second language. Yeah. And you find it easier to express those emotions in in yeah, your second language? It's, it's it's interesting, but it's that's the way it is. Yeah. Wow, that's I, I that's pretty remarkable. Um, I, I don't know. I don't really like. I'm I'm sort of amazed by that. I don't really have a comment on that. That's really, um, <laughs> yeah. I it, don't know. Wow, that's that works for me. <laughs> well, it, it clearly has been working for you. You've been making records for uh, what about 15 years now. So yeah, I mean, you certainly must be doing something right. Um, so how has so, so you're here, you, you've been playing, uh, you know, sort of a short string of dates yeah. here in the Northeast. How's that been going for you? Good. Uh, I've played a few shows in New Jersey and two in New York City. Yeah. How's the response been? Uh, response was good. Yeah? Yeah. If people listen, they, they understand what, I, what I'm saying. If, if they don't listen, I, I, there's nothing you can you do. You can't help them. <laughs> no. Well, have you, have you been getting attentive audiences at some of these yeah, shows? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. And you played, uh, I guess it was, uh, you did something in uh, Jersey City, right? No, Last uh, week? Or was it? It was, uh, what was it called? Fair Lawn. Oh, Stashes. Yes. Neil put you at Stashes in Fair Lawn. Oh, he puts, he puts everybody. Have you guys played there yet, Chris? <laughs> no, I have not played Stashes in Fair Lawn. You'll get there. The You'll Burns haven't broken into North Jersey quite That's, yet. How do you like that place? It. I love it. Yeah? It's a great place, yeah. Is that, uh, yeah, because you know what? I like that's. It's a small room, but people go to play to music. Listen to, to, listen. to listen to music. Yeah they, yeah, they go there to listen to music. Yeah. Um, and that's. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, it's, it's funny because, oh, sorry, it's funny because um, 
I feel like the stash is, cra- you know, they can get a little loud sometimes and, and your music is, uh, you know, tends to be very brooding. Um, do people yeah. kind of quiet down and, and tune into you when you're playing at a place like that? I had to uh, shut him down a little bit. Yeah, some, some of them. Yeah. Did you though? Were you able to? Of course. Yeah. You just well, gotta, I mean, you, you just got to tell him. Yeah. Yeah. The Rick Barry method, man. He does the same thing. Does he? Yeah. You're there to see music. You should be listening. Wow. It's yeah. a way of looking at it. Well, because I mean, sometimes you just, uh, you know, I guess it depends on uh, on what the audience, you know, or you. you is it, I guess it, it's just whatever read you can get on the audience. But that's that's something. So you just say, yeah, guys, be quiet. Like. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that. Wow. Especially in pubs or bars. Yeah? Yeah. Um, do you find it's easier to tour when you have um, some type of label, uh, some type of promotion, some type of you know team supporting you oh, yeah, uh, versus just, just hitting the road independent of, of those things? Of course, it's really helpful to have a label. Yeah, helping with organization and and, and, and promotion, but uh, you have to uh, work for yourself and until you get there. You know, mm-hmm. you have you have to build your 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 act. And so you've been making records as Son of the Velvet Rat for fifteen years, almost about, yeah. mm-hmm. and. Um, What's the most noticeable change uh, that you perceive about your own writing, your own performance, your own presentation of this material? I mean, uh, it's it's. I want to keep it interesting for me, so I have to. Uh, I want to make sure that my songs change and 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 develop in a way. I don't want to write the same song again, you know. Mm-hmm. In, in, I don't want to use the same chord progression. I don't want to uh, use the same uh, rhyme rhythm. You know, I want to keep moving. And do you try? Is it ever a conscious effort to, because you've been making music for so long, because you've got so many records? Uh, you know, you say you you do this for you, but is there ever a part of you that keeps? the audience in mind when you're writing these songs or at least producing uh, the records of, of course you all beca- music is is my way of communicating with people so of course i i think about it but it's mostly after the fact after i've written a song after i've i've written the music the lyrics that i, that I think about mm, how, how will i present this piece of work okay but of course, you have to think of, of your audience in a way. Mm-hmm. Now, um, when did you? It, it when doesn't uh, have. To, uh, it, uh, I want to make sure it doesn't affect the creative process, though. I see. So it's it's, yeah. So you you, you write, yeah. You you write the music, you write the lyrics, and then uh, once that, you know, once that portion is done, then it's then you take the audience in mind if I understand when you say you pr- you know when you're talking about the presentation it's essentially the production yeah, uh, I have to uh, see if if this song that I just wrote communicates with people and, and if it if it means something to them too you see it's sometimes that's how do you make that determination uh, I, I can when see you're when I you're making a record prior to well, when I play it live? I, I feel I feel the reaction of, of, of my audience. You know, mm. I feel how they react to it, if they understand it or not. Or if it's, it's does that if they don't quite understand it, do you try to rework the song in a way that would no. maybe help them or do no. you just kind of say this song. is okay <laughs> yeah well no because i mean everybody everybody's process is a little different and i'm, yeah. I'm always curious about that because some people try to some people get a little stubborn about the material and they say no we're going to make this work we'll do it in three or four different ways and other uh, people you sure know kind of just kill works. their darlings and let them go yeah i think that's more my approach okay um yeah, I mean, this many records in, it's it's probably a pretty good approach. <laughs> it seems to be working for you. Yeah, <laughs> it works for me, yeah. There you go. Um, so when did you first pick up an instrument? 
Oh, I think when I was 16 or 17 years old. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow, and what, what brought you to it? No, uh, actually that's not true. Uh, my, my parents forced me to play the violin for a few years. Okay, well of course, that's, <laughs> I, I mean, what, what parents wouldn't uh, exactly. force their kid to play an instrument. Yeah, but then I, I stopped with music and uh, picked, it up, picked up the guitar when I was like 16 or 17. Okay, and what, uh, what brought you to that? What brought you to the guitar? All those French songwriters, actually, and then, yeah. and then of course, like people like Leonard Cohen, Towns Vincent, those people. Oh, excellent! Do you um, you ever try that? You know, like that finger pick triplet style, like Leonard Cohen does. That's I don't know. I yeah, I play a little guitar too, so it's, yeah, it's, I, think I find that to be very uh, exceedingly difficult to do and oh, yeah. sing at the same time. I have to. I have to watch a YouTube video of Leonard Cohen. Uh, I've n uh, never thought about his guitar playing, actually. Yeah. I mean, Leonard Cohen, along with Jacques Brel, like, those are two guys, like, I think as players themselves, really underrated. Leonard Cohen was doing crazy finger-picking thing, and the way that Jacques was strumming is something I've always stolen as a guitar player. Yeah. It's like that super fast triplets that are happening. That's my kind of stuff. Yeah, really, because mm. uh, you think of those guys as just songwriters, yeah, songwriters. and you never consider them as instrumentalists. Mm -hmm. But And a lot of those people, and I think of uh, even someone like Nick Drake, too, with those the oh, different Nick tunings and the finger player. style. Yeah, yeah, I mean, these guys are great guitar players, great instrumentalists. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I guess it's just the quality of their songwriting is so unique and so idiosyncratic that it almost, as instrumentalists, that almost gets looked at as secondary. Mm, oh, he was a great guitar player. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're all... All those tunings, uh, he, 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 I think he would never remem remember what he played on, on, a, on a certain recording. Well, I'm certainly glad he, uh, he seemed... <laughs> He seemed to remember. Seemed like he might uh, have, at least, you know, you know at least when it was time to like get in that. the studio. Yeah. Figured it out. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, when did it become clear? How long did it take from when you pick up a guitar to you saying, "Well, you know what? I think I wanna, I wanna go out and perform now." Like, how long oh, did just, that? Just a few years, actually, two yeah. or three years, yeah. and then I was, I thought I was ready. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that seems about right. Did you did you start writing right away? Was it always going to be a tool for you to yes. for your songwriting? Yeah, I, that was my my main interest. I wanted to communicate with people because I'm not a big talker and uh, and I was kind of shy at that age. So, music was my way out of that. Okay, and has that has that worked for you? Yes. Okay, I hope so. Because yeah. you also the um, the other sort of main member of Son of the Velvet Rat is your uh, your your wife. Yeah, and I met her through music actually. That's perfect. So I guess uh, that <laughs> I guess you know learning to communicate through music uh, definitely worked in that respect. Yeah, helped in the end, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right, it helped. Yeah, helped you. <laughs> it did. I'm still learning how to communicate. Period. So don't worry about me. <laughs> Because apparently this is part of communicating where you don't just talk. Like, you also have to listen. Never yeah. quite figured that out. Still working on that. Yeah. That's my way of communicating. There you go. So um, so what, what is that like, being in a band with your, with your partner? You know, not just a musical it's, partner, but your, your yeah, life partner. How does, that, how does that work? It's very good in many ways. It's, it can be difficult because, you, of course, every every uh, musician has a, an opinion about uh, details of arrangement of producing can be difficult but it's also helpful in a lot of ways and what well, how is it how she, is she it also do, does the cover artwork for most of the albums so oh really yeah I mean this is this is great Dude, this is I mean I you know I yeah I mean both records like really well oh, uh, really well done um, and that's always, yeah, that's always, uh, even we just said it with Jaron and his record too. Mm -hmm. It's always nice to have somebody in house, yeah. uh, that can, that can handle that stuff. Uh, and I, that, that is something for which I have no gift, mm -hmm. uh, the me, visual me arts, but, um, so is that, how is it, um, how do you keep, how do you keep it separate? How do you keep? 
you know, uh, we have to pay the bills. I'm still working on that. Uh, and it's then it's we have really to write hard to keep it uh, to keep it separate. Yeah, actually. yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it's it's. I mean, I I hope I certain. I don't want to make assumptions, but I certainly hope it's uh, it's working thus far. It's working, and there are good examples of other couples who have managed that through through their lives and through that their car careers. So. Oh yeah. yeah. Like Paul and Linda McCartney, <laughs> uh, Tom Waits and yeah, Catherine maybe, Brennan. Maybe those two, yeah. I remember Fleetwood Mac at one point or another. Oh, well, that's that's that maybe not great maybe for all not of them. So much. No, probably a little more Tom Waits, Kathleen Brennan. Let's yeah. let's go with that one. Yeah. Let's stick to that. Exactly. Uh, let's stick to that. Yeah, yeah. Paul and Linda, though, he never they never spent a day apart from what he did. Oh, really? That a little bit of jail time in uh, Japan, uh, but I think he was over there for like a week. Other than that, that was the most time they ever spent apart uh -huh. when they were married because uh, she was they were just together every single uh, every single day so um, has working with her transformed your songwriting in any way you know it thinking about the Waits her. and Brennan thing because uh, he was a different songwriter yeah and then they you know she he brought her in and that changed everything uh, I listen to what she's saying I mean, if if she has an opinion about something, I think about it. Yeah, and that of course that changes uh, lyrics or, or melodies. You know, it's, it takes a while until it's it uh, uh, transforms. But uh, I usually think about what she's saying and I keep it in mind. Well, that's good. That's that's. I guess that's also part of communicating that active listening part. <laughs> you take notes, Chris. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so, um, how did your, uh, you know, how how did your, you know, like your family, your friends, your peers that have known you and seen you kind of come up from that sixteen-year-old uh, just figuring out guitar? start reacting when you began working with bigger names, you know, like Lucinda Williams or uh, Joe Henry? Well, I think, uh, of course, that makes an impression. If people know those guys, they, they, they know that it's not easy to work with them uh, and to get to, to know them. Mm -hmm. It's not like I approached them, they approached me. So... Really, they reached out to you? That's how that started? I mean, Lucinda was at the show that we were playing at the Hotel Cafe in, in, in Los Angeles, and she came up okay. to me after the show, and, and that's how it started. Wow. That's something. Yeah, because she's, I, I mean, because she didn't, I mean, I know, you know, she's, she's out and around, but she didn't really make records that often. Like, she's, you know, she seems like she only really comes out when she believes in a project, when she really has something to say about a project. So, yeah. you know, did you feel, you know, humbled or flattered or did you feel first, more of first like didn't a... didn't recognize her. Oh, yeah? No, uh, I didn't recognize her. And, but then uh, she lifted her, her hat and I could see her face in that. Okay. But she's a very nice and generous person. Well, that's good. Yeah. I mean, then there's, there's probably a, a bit too little of... Uh, you know, generosity uh, going around. Maybe, yeah. Everybody works on his own business. So, um, sticking with that for a moment, um, when you, how does working with bigger name collaborators make you feel with respect to how far along you are in your career? Is that meaning, do you feel like you sort of hit, you know, you, you clear a certain hurdle by working with people like that yeah because uh, if you work with r real good people uh, that have a high level of, of musicianship uh, you w want to make sure that your work is up to to that mm -hmm. of course everybody compares Oh yeah, everybody compares. Yeah, yeah. And you you got to be on your on your best level. Okay. And do you? Is there ever a point 
where you feel you need that, uh, almost like a form of validation for your career or your life as no, an artist. No, but uh, it, it was a very uh, good moment when I, when I realized those people worship my, my work and, Excellent. and like my, my lyrics, my music, and of course that helped me grow as an artist too. Mm -hmm. did, uh, did anybody kind of teach you any interesting, did you learn anything interesting? Did you learn any lessons that, no. you know? From those people? Yeah. No, the, the, no, no. No? no. <laughs> you didn't? <laughs> no. Well, maybe, the, but then maybe that's, maybe that's a positive because maybe that just shows everybody kind of on the same level. That's that's they, I, where there's just nothing me, but yeah. respect going around, not just, oh, yeah, we're going to find this. We're going to take this guy and, uh, you know, we're going to make him into something. It's like, no, we're just going to work with someone that we respect. Yeah, that's the way it was. Well, that's great. That might even be better. It, it was really good for me. Yeah. Excellent. So um, as we start to uh, wrap up, I do want to ask you how um, how Mint 400 Records uh, came into the picture because you know as we've said before you're you're from Austria you live out in California um, so how did that relationship come into play we were reaching out to a few labels and, and Neil was the first one to respond okay and he, he does our dis our digital distribution okay and uh, the, the vinyl and the CDs are uh, produced by fluff and gravy in Portland Oregon Oh, yeah, yeah, I see it right there. Okay, yeah, and digitally by Min 400 yeah. Records. Excellent. And he's a great guy to, to work with. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Neil's excellent. I mean, we've, uh, you know, we've had a bunch of his uh, bands on the show. He came on the show much earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I, you know, I'm always, I always get excited when I get that, uh, when I get that text message or that email, and he says, "Hey, I've got some people coming in. Do you guys have room?" Um, because I feel like there's definitely a discerning taste uh, on that, you know, with that label. So you kind of know you're not, um, you're not getting a bunch of scrubs <laughs> when he uh, when he sends you when he sends you people to. Made four hundred uh, records, no scrubs. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so what? Has Mint 400 or uh, Fluff and Gravy Records, any of these people that you've worked with, uh, you know, distribution wise, label wise, um, what have they been able to do for you that, you know, maybe la other, other sort of past, you know, labels or management or distribution haven't been able to do? Well, my former labels. We're from Austria, of course, mm -hmm. so they, it's limited to a very small country. And now I'm here. I'm, I'm a dual citizen now, and I have a label here, and of course that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. They can promote it uh, much better than a little label from Austria can, of course. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> now. Um I guess we'll. Uh, I, I just have one more question for you, and then we'll get to uh, we'll get you up on stage and, and get you singing a couple of these uh, a couple of these songs. Um, what work is left there to do for you? What 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 do you feel you need to accomplish oh. that you haven't accomplished yet? That's easy. I want to make a better record. Okay. Next, the, uh, I, uh, I want to make a, a record that shows a new side and um, has uh, something meaningful to me that I haven't discovered yet. It's Excellent. like the ever-searching better record that's always out there, right? Uh, for me, yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I feel... That's the goal for the next one. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I feel the progression, though, listening to, you know, the first record and then, uh, you know kind of hearing songs from other records up to this one. So it almost feels like that's, in a way, you're just saying you just want to continue the trajectory and say, you know, because each record, in my opinion, each record's a little bit better than the one that came before it. Well, and isn't you. that isn't that the path you want to be on? So thank you. I'm glad it's not the other way around. No, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, if it was, I wouldn't say anything. The Weezer <laughs> theorem, if you will. Oh, just yeah. Gets progressively that's, worse. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, that, that idea in art that like, you know, you work to make the most perfect thing you could possibly create. And as soon as it's done, you let it go and you work to make something even better. 
that's something that I think, you know, as artists, if you will, that's something you should always strive for is doing as best you can and then recognizing that next time you do something, it's going to have to be better or what's yeah. the point. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a hard choice. All right, it's a hard thing to work on. Yeah, and a hard that thing to... It interesting. Yeah. Oh, you try to find new things. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I lied to you. Now I have one more question. Th okay. And this one actually comes from Neil, because uh, I guess he, he claims to have never asked before. Uh, where's the name come from? <laughs> Many people and then, ask and me then that, we'll, And I, then we'll uh, let you play some songs. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or would you prefer to keep it a mystery? Like, I wouldn't uh, care, but I just don't remember it. Do you really? You just have no? <laughs> just no. chose it and it's just so far gone? Yeah. I, uh, maybe it was a bad dream. I don't know. I don't know. I like it a lot. It's, it's an evocative <laughs> name. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, son when of the... When Lucinda heard it first, the first time, she said, I'm not sure about the name. <laughs> no? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, I, I, I hope you continue to prove her wrong. I hope so, too. All right, so the studio record is called Dorado. The live record is called The Late Show. Son of the Velvet Rat. Uh, Chris going to read a couple quick ads, and uh, let's get you on stage. Just get you set Thank up you. to play some music for us. I'm going on Oh, thanks, Chris. No problem. Don't man. step on the vinyl. I'm trying not to step on the vinyl or your cell phone. Thank you. We're keeping it very professional here at One More yeah. Brian Erickson. All right. How's it going, guys? How are things? How you been? I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking. This week's episode of One More is brought to you by the Asbury Park Music Foundation. The APMF, or AMP, raises money to support youth music programs throughout Asbury Park that provide lasting skills, self-confidence, and life-changing experiences for the underserved kids in our community. This includes funding for the Hip Hop Institute at the Boys and Girls Club of Monmouth, in-school music programs at Hope Academy, and scholarships for kids to attend the Lake House Music Academy. APMF also sponsors events such as Suburbia Friday Nights, which bring a mix of hip hop and rock on the first Friday of every month. Sunday sessions, which feature prominent acoustic performers and a very Asbury holiday show on December 9th. If you're interested in keeping Asbury Park's legacy of music alive by making a meaningful difference for the underserved youth in our community, head over to Asbury Park Music Lives or asburypartmusiclives.org to make a donation. And while you're there, pick up a music-saved Asbury Park t-shirt. All proceeds make it possible to support Music Save My Life Youth Program. Jim, as always, thank you so much for letting us do this every week. And I'm going to keep buying just a little bit more time so you can finish tuning. And are you ready to go? And I can introduce, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for son of the velvet rat. I'm gonna play a song called Blood Red Shoes. Show. There is a 
band on a bandstand and ladies in line at the bar. I got nowhere to go if I can't be where you are. Two fingers snapping and I see you sway on your dancer's feet. A finger snapping and a clapping hands to the mercy of me. I see you follow me and I, I follow you anywhere. From the killing floor all the way to the county fair. You got blood ritual. Blood ritual. Thank you. This is called Surfer Joe. See him come and go, come and go. 
Thanks, guys. That was very good, man. I really enjoyed that. Got a lot of events for you this week, ladies and gentlemen. Strap in. Events for the week of December 3rd. Monday, December 3rd. Dear Nora, Teenage Halloween, Beauty and Algebra 2 are at your Caribbean restaurant in Long Branch. That's at 7 p.m. So that's happening like now. Just go over. Or you can do Happy Mondays presents The Big Dumb Burn, Sunshine Spaz, Wet Brain, and Where's Tino at the Wonder Bar at 7 p.m. That's actually starting like as we speak. I'm going over there afterwards. Come party with us. Tuesday, December 4th. Writer of such hits as Baby It's Cold Outside and The Hanukkah Song. Dave Vargo presents the Pierce Sessions featuring Foggy Otis and Michael Patrick at Pierce Memorial Church at 7.30 p.m. Connor Bracken, Jack and Bethany Duo, and John Conti are at the downtown at 8 p.m. I haven't seen John Conti in a minute. He's still a great guy. Wednesday, December 5th, Deirdre Forrest, Pam Flores, Cat London, and Sahara Moon are Lizzie Rose Music and Tuckerton at 7 p.m. Mint 400 Records presents Ruby Bones and A Bird dual album release show at Pet Shop in Jersey City at 8 p.m. Cranston and Dean, the one, the only. Alex Squid, Fiducia, and Riley Shire at the downtown at 8 p.m. Ella Ross, Meg Cannon, and Jack are at the Asbury Hotel at 8 p.m. Thursday, December 6th, Kim and Dave at Novita Bistro at 6 p.m. Pianos become the teeth. Gatherers and Cara Cara at the AP Brewery at 7 p.m. Third Time's a Charm, Kissing the Klepto, A Beautiful Somewhere in Television Skies at Boon Tunes at 7.30 p.m. Catherine Quintana, Jake Tavel, The Brothers Union are at the Downtown at 8 p.m. And Arlen Files and the Brokenhearted are at the Saint at 9 p.m. Friday, December 7th, Twist, Blaze, and Blue Vervain at the AP Brewery at 7 p.m. Big Muff, oh boy. Nuff Knots, Archawal, Our Bodies Themselves, and Lisa Pope are at John and Peter's at 8 p.m. Justin Pope's wife. Justin Pope's wife, Lisa Pope. That checks yeah, out. Great singer and uh, songwriter in her own There you go. Uh, Natalie Farrell, Leeds, and Anthony Walker at the Hasbury Hotel. Tony Appleseed, Puppy Grease, Kathy Quintana, and Jenny Mustaches at the Chubby Pickle at 9 p.m. And, of course, the show we've all been waiting for. The motherfucking Paper Jets celebrate the release of their first album in a really long time. Every day forever at the Asbury Lanes. The show also features Dave Mooney and viewers like you. Tara Dent and the Blind Pilots. We're Ghosts Now and Bobby Mahoney and the Seventh Son. Doors are at 7, music at 8. We've still got a couple of tickets left. Hit up Brian in to get tickets. Go to that show, you dingus. Saturday, December 8th, Asbury Parks of Fisher, SantaCon Crawl. Go to the SantaCon.org for more detail, 1 p.m. Matthew McAndrew, Bone and Marrow, Mike from Late Waves, and Rachel Ann Adopkin and the High Anxiety Blues Band are at the Pop Break Local Christmas Party at Convention Hall at 7 p.m. Joe Galupo, the one, the only. Wreath, Rugburn, I get those often, damn it, Brian, and the Grey Vines at the Roadhouse at 7.30 p.m. Hotspot Boulevard, the Great Wall of Alcohol at Hy-Vee Tavern at 9 p.m. The Great Wall of Alcohol is actually the best band name I've ever heard in my life lifetime. Uh, the Swiss Guard, American Dinosaur, and Sunny Knockout are at John and Peter's at 9 p.m. Sunday, December 9th, Save Face, A Will Away, and Future Teens at the AP Brewery, and close out your weekend at the Paramount Theater as the Asbury Park Music Foundation presents a very Asbury holiday show featuring Taylor Tote, Mackenzie Brown, a.k.a. Bottle Blonde, Dez from Dez and the Swagmatics, Remember Jones, Waiting on Mongo, uh, Danny Clinch and the Tangiers Blues Band, Emily Grove, and so, so, so many more humans that play music. Go to Asbury Park Music Liz.org for full lineup. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Jaron Love of the Lampshades. Did I get that name right? That's right, yeah. Hell yes. Jaron Love of the Lampshades.
fire ranger out to fix the guy's tire it's on his work and hey it's better than when i got mixed up with the wrong guys in high school i found god got a wife and now everything's gonna be all right Thank you so much. I'm so sorry, by the way. I, I didn't. We didn't know when that first song was ending. We thought it was like a false oh, ending. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 yeah, no, 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 no. So that was. But that that's good. I I like the fake out though. We appreciate that. So Jaron Love, of the Lampshades, and George of Son of the Velvet Rat, live from the Asbury Park Music Foundation for Chris Dubrow. I am. I have been, and I remain. Brian Erickson. We'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>